everything you're going to do in an organization soon is going to have some element of change in it that you're going to be focused on. So whether it's adapting artificial intelligence, it's a reorganization, it's uh, you went through a layoff, a reduction in force, a RIF, or you're about to go through one, you've got a new position you're moving into, you're helping somebody else move into, you've got a new business model, you just did a merger or an acquisition, or you're about to do one, or you're post-merger. And we pay attention to that, and we miss the bigger thing, which is a riptide of societal, cultural, and technological change. This isn't political, but a lot of this stuff has been politicized. And it's distracting people, and it's dividing people, and it's driving down the performance of your organization. So what I think we need to do is figure out how to reduce the distraction, reduce the division, and get people to focus. We have a loneliness epidemic in this country, and I think it's very much tied to how we're divided and distracted. And so I want to look at a few factors that have been driving this for decades. Um, first and foremost, we'll start with church membership. In this country, a lot of people define themselves as being Christian or Judeo-Christian Americans. And until recently, like three quarters of us, or relatively recently, belonged to some sort of church that was part of our identity, whether we went all the time. Now we're below 50% of the population belonging or identifying with being a part of a, a church or religion. PTAs. When you went to school, there was a PTA, or Parent Teacher Association, Parent Teacher Organization. Now it's down to like 20%. Single households, 13% in 1960, 29% today. Single parents, 9% in 1950, 23% today. Across every demographic, we're spending more and more time alone, and we're not interacting with each other. We're not interacting with our neighbors. We're only interacting with people who are in our little bubbles. And I don't care how any of you voted. I guarantee you if we went out there and had a glass of wine, a beer, a cup of coffee, whatever, and sat and talked about what we cared about, we will have so much more in common than we have in difference. It's simply profitable to divide us. Back on the loneliness front, there's been a lot of research on this. Surgeon General's declared it an epidemic. Cigna Insurance has been researching it for about a decade. Right now, about 58% of adults report being lonely. Gen Z population, it can be as high as 80%. It's higher in younger populations. It's, young, it's higher in folks who are lower income. It's higher in racial majority, minorities. Why does this matter? It matters a lot because loneliness is a threat. We leapt to the top of the food chain because we could communicate and collaborate. It wasn't survival of the fittest, it was survival of the friendliness. It was our ability to work together that allows us to thrive and thrive. And that's what drives the performance in your organizations. So if we're lonely, our amygdala goes into overdrive. Our sympathetic nervous system goes out of whack. We start viewing everybody as, are you with me or against me? Us versus them, fight or flight, did you vote for my candidate or not? I mean, it's that divisive, and it's distracting, and it's only going to get worse going into the fall. So I want to stop for a second and look at similarities that happen about every century. Stuff that happened in the 1920s, stuff that's happening now. And history doesn't repeat itself, but it does rhyme. So in the 1920s, we had the 1918 flu, so it was called the Spanish flu. We had COVID-19 here. These will be viewed, and probably by historians, as plagues. Plagues reorder society. And they're existential crises that cause us to question things. And I think that's what been a big question around, where does work fit in our lives? The technology that disrupted the 1920s was electricity. It was the industrial era. It, was, it changed everything in the home when we suddenly had vacuum cleaners and washing machines and dishwashers. Now we're going into the augmented era, and we're just starting to feel the impact of AI pervasively slipping into everything we do. The labor disruption in the 1920s was physical with the manufacturing lines, and now it's going to be cognitive, and we're just beginning to feel that. The work hours in the 1920s became eight hours a day, 40 hours a week. Unions, yes, had a big hand in that, but it started with Henry Ford, and not because he was a good guy, he really wasn't, but he noticed that all the accidents happened on the 9th, 10th, and 11th hour of the production line. So he kept the workday at eight hours because it, was, it optimized physical performance. Now we're trying to look at how do we optimize physical and cognitive performance. Four-day work weeks, hybrid work, we're going to see more and more experiments around that. <clears throat> Gender role. In the 1920s, we had the 19th Amendment, which gave women the right to vote. So women went from being property to having some power to participating in progress. Now we've got changes around gender and sexuality. And if that stuff makes you uncomfortable, 
I get it. It's a very fast change on something very fundamental. You may say you don't believe in it. Okay. It's happening all over the world. Inequality. I mentioned the Raj Shetty research. Income inequality statistically is measured, was measured by this uh, guy named Ginny who came up with, this Italian statistician, who came up with this idea of a coefficient. And it basically means if I have 100 people and I have $100 and I give everybody a dollar, that's absolute equality, good, bad, or indifferent. So your Gini coefficient is zero. If I give one person $100 and 99 people no money, that Gini coefficient is one. That's absolute inequality. So the higher the number, the more unequal we are. We are now at the highest level we've been since the 1920s. Immigration. And it was a hot button issue. I'm just going to point out that in the 1920s, we had the highest percentage of folks who were not born in this country as a percentage of our population. We have that again now. Um, and the cultural response to these things in the 1920s, we had the rise of the KKK, we had the communist Red Scares, now we have domestic terrorism groups in the US and in other parts of the world. And then geopolitically, in the 1920s, we had the rise of fascism, which was a precursor to World War II. Now we have democracy versus autocracy. Four billion people vote in 2024. That's about 40% of the globe. We've never had that many people vote at once. So it's eerie how these things are kind of rhyming. And when I look at them, the first and last things are like questions about our mortality that change how we think about things. These rapid changes, which are affecting all of our work, is, requires us to adapt and adapt every single day. And then some of these changes that are societal and cultural, and I get them uncomfortable, but I think you have to talk about them or at least acknowledge that we're going through them, can cause fear, can cause more resentment. So when you look back at that iceberg of change, your change is at the top. Your success in leading this change is going to be directly related to your ability to manage what's happening below the surface. And what happens below the surface is velocity of change is exhausting. Um, some people have fear of uh, terrorism. Some people have just, am I going to be replaced by AI? I'm tired of learning new technologies. Um, evolving national identity. How, do I, how am I an American if I'm surrounded by people who don't eat like me, look like me, pray like me, speak like me? Um, <clears throat> income and equality or opportunity. This is not my country if there isn't an opportunity for my kids to do better than I did. Societal and cultural change. Another pandemic which seems possible um, because I think they think that they may now be instead of every 100 years, every 50 years. Um, and then just general levels of uncertainty, economic uncertainty. We've been waiting for a recession now for two years. No economist seems to have gotten that right. How do you manage this? First, you listen. And it's not listening to everybody's opinion and integrating them. It's people haven't felt seen and heard. I think we got to this moment because we weren't seeing and hearing each other. Solidarity. Solidarity is simply saying, this is why we're here as a company. This is what we do. This is our North Star. This is what we care about. This is why you join the company. And with that, you build trust. You can't do anything without trust. With trust, you can do anything. 